been quite a bit of research actually that's that's done on this. Um, still moving target. I mean, how to build teams, how to um, how to get the best team in place. Uh, and some of the questions that we're going to address today will hopefully uh, start to answer some of those questions that you have. All right. So before and before we start, I want to um, have the panel introduce themselves, as well as some of the guests that are here from Nishar, as well from, as well from the Office of Research and from Faculty Development. Um, this is co-sponsored by Office of Research and Faculty Development. Importantly, faculty development provided lunch for us, so I think that's maybe the most important thing. So why don't I let the panel introduce themselves, and if I can have the panel uh, uh, explain briefly um, what they've done with team science, what type of teams they've put together in particular, that would be great to help with the um, participants here about. Okay. Um, I'm John Younger. I'm um, in emergency medicine. Um, I'm also um, um, one of the directors of the Biointerfaces Institute, which is a collaborative between engineering, uh, the medical school, the dental school, college of pharmacy. Um, and uh, my interest, my research interest is in, um, is in infectious disease and specifically in um, infections related to medical devices and so uh, biofilm formation, things like that. Um, um, if, depending on what audience I'm in, I describe it that way or, or I describe it as um, I'm very interested in, um, in how um, microorganisms interact with engineered surfaces um, and that sort of takes it in a slightly different direction. Um, my uh, collaborators um, I've had a lot of collaborators over the year. I really enjoy collaborating, and my collaborators have included sort of usual suspects uh, in the medical school side, but a lot of unusual suspects outside. So I collaborate most closely right now with um, with faculty in chemical engineering, um, and to a lesser degree in, in bioengineering, um, and in applied mathematics. Um, and we work on problems related to how bacteria touch plastic, both in devices, but also um, in industrial settings and in uh, sort of renewable water settings as well. So we, we do research that's straight far away from just direct medical applications. Okay. Okay. I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> uh, my name is Amy Rothberg. I'm in the Department of Medicine and the Division of Endocrinology, Metabolism, and Diabetes. And I do primarily um, research in obesity and weight regulation. And I run a specifically a weight management program and clinic, um, and we collaborate which is a demonstration unit of the Michigan Metabolomics and Obesity Society um, Center and the Nutrition Obesity Research Center. So we pull collaborators from both those centers as well as across campus. So I collaborate with people from the School of Public Health. Um, people, I also partner with insurance companies because we look at cost effectiveness um, of our interventions. And then I partner with other scientists, for example, from the Molecular and Neurologic Behavior Institute um, for more in-depth phenotyping um, that we do. So, that's about it. I'm George Michaud. I'm from the Department of Anesthesiology and also the Neuroscience Graduate Program. Um, my major academic and intellectual interest is in consciousness mechanisms of human consciousness and also how we can measure and monitor human consciousness. And I have sort of two teams that I work with. One is my laboratory, which is multidisciplinary in nature. Uh, we have representatives from anesthesiology, experimental neuroscience, physics, uh, biomedical engineering. Actually, one of our team members is here, uh, Stephanie. Uh, and even sometimes philosophy. We've had philosophers in the lab as well. Um, so it's, it's truly multidisciplinary. And then the other aspect of uh, team science or team investigation that I'm involved in relates to clinical trials and prospective trials. And with a collaborator at Washington University, we formed a, a, a network um, focused on neurologic and psychiatric outcomes of surgery. Uh, our first major studies were um, related to monitoring depth of anesthesia and awareness or consciousness during anesthesia. And uh, in a two-year period, we collectively, prospectively recruited over 26,000 patients um, uh, to, to study this phenomenon at uh, four different institutions. Definitely takes a team to do that. 
I'm Vicki Ellingrod. I'm, I'm a professor in the College of Pharmacy and also the Department of Psychiatry in the Med School. Um, I also direct the Clinical Pharmacogenomics Lab at the College of Pharmacy, and my research interests are kind of using pharmacogenetic tools to help predict um, who might have better outcomes or more side effects from medications that are used to treat uh, mental illness. Um, because uh, I'm more of a schizophrenia researcher, um, and schizophrenia only affects about 1% of the population, a lot of my teams are kind of still forming in that I'm working with different groups across the country to kind of phenotype patients with schizophrenia um, as it relates to um, the incidence of cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome because it's a population, one, that doesn't affect a large percentage of the population, but two, it's a population that doesn't get looked at in terms of cardiovascular health. And so just getting people to get a weight on, on subjects and getting that um, mass of people that then you can look at in a pharmacogenetic investigation is is kind of one of the challenges um, that we face. So I have collaborators at the University of Toronto, University of Iowa, University of Illinois, um, and we're working on a collaboration with the University of uh, I think it's Philadelphia. Um, but that's also been a challenge, getting just getting a collective phenotype, everyone looking at the same thing and, and getting those samples. So I hope I hope what we well, what we try to do, and I hope what we get a sense of, is that the teams that were built by the <coughs> by the panel were actually either multidisciplinary from different schools, um, both from faculty and from staff, professional staff, and perhaps even liaisons from the public, as well as um, different atmospheres, research versus purely clinical. Um, so um, I, you know, I don't know what the mix of, of your interests are here, but I think that your questions on really related to the early stages of, of building a team, I think they'll be able to answer them. Two other people I want to introduce is Sonia Jacobs, who's from the Faculty Development Office, Faculty Affairs. Um, as you, as many of you are early stage investigators, she's someone you wanted to become uh, acquainted with because she has a large number of programs. I think they're here somewhere. Um, that that for you to get involved in to help your career uh, go, go through. Uh, Chris Black from the Office of Research, who is. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to also contribute as we talk about how to identify investigators. Um, there are resources that the Office of Research has developed to identify investigators across campus and across the entire U of M campus, not just the medical campus, but in all the campus, to identify investigators who might be good participants in your team. Um, I think the discussion from the folks up front will be how to identify those people and how to contact or engage those folks. And then finally, the Mishar team, Marilyn Lance, who's the head of education at Mishar, faculty lead, Lise Anderson, um, Jing Liu, Nancy, oh boy, thank you, <laughs> and, and Christy. Hi, Thank you. Um, and so they're the folks that put this together and helped coordinate this. Again, this is the first time we put this workshop together, so your input at the end is really important. So let's start with the first subject. If, does anybody have any questions before we get started? Logistical? Good, let's start at the beginning. Let's start how to build a team and how to find the people with the right expertise. And maybe the panel can start out by suggesting how they went forward with doing that. <laughs> Putting the pressure on you, be fed yeah. And, and one, one other thing, that's what you really want interaction. So as you have questions, <coughs> surely you're not the only one, so please, you know, press the panel. So, Maybe just to get the ball rolling. I, mean, I think the first aspect of thinking about the team or finding the people really is what is your question? What is, you know, what's bringing you to an academic setting? What's keeping you up late thinking about the problem? What, what, is, what is your vision? Um, and and I, I think in general uh, for an academic career, it's, it's really essential because to me, I mean, we'll talk about logistics, but ultimately the fuel and, and the organizing principle is really going to be your interest and your motivation to solve the question uh, or to answer the question um, or to engage in that activity. So I just, it's sort of amorphous, but on the other hand, I think it, you know, it's, it's fundamental um, to a team, it's, it's fundamental to science in general. <clears throat> Yeah, I would, I would back that up. I think that um, 
I think so. How to build a team is one thing, but then, but I think it is a more existential question. What exactly is it you're trying to build, and why is it you're trying to do that? So um, I think it's useful that you understand your own motivations pretty quickly. Having so so all of us up here speak from incredibly stupid bad experience, and so um, and so if we have any wisdom, it's because we've left scorched earth behind us somewhere. Um, except maybe um, the. Uh, so, but, but what exactly is it you want to build? So, so I think you need to be, be clear if, if the, you know, if the goal is, I think I'm going to be the one that cures cancer and I need people in my wake to help me do the heavy lifting, that, that's fair, that's one thing, but that's not everything. And so there are other teams, right? So the, if, the, if the team is, you know, if the goal is I want to surround myself with people that are very smart, smarter than me, hopefully, and, um, and know things very complementary to the things I know, and I want to work on this area, and sometimes we'll do what I want to work on, and sometimes we'll do what they want to work on, that's a really different structure, right? And so I think that the phrase that was used recently by a friend of mine is like, well, if, if by team do you mean minions, or do you mean partners? Partners, right, and so there's a time and a place in the you know in this in, you know there's time and a place for minions, um, but it's it's really it's very different, right? And so I guess that one thing you should understand about yourself is is that um, you know as you say if you say well I have this problem I'm going to pull a team together working on that problem, you know would you sort of you know conversely would you be willing to be pulled into somebody else's team to work on their problem or not, right? And so that's so there's there's no I and team in, unless it's your team, right? and then, then it's all about your team, right? And so I think that having a sense of what it is you're trying, what it is you want to get done um, is important. And, and how much do you want that to be, I need experts to work on my problem, or I want to get better at this field, and I want to work on my problems and related problems that I might not be driving on. Those are those are very different things, and they, they come with their own challenges. Not, neither one of them is better, but they are very different in, in terms of how you go about trying to assemble them. I think, too, I, you know, I started my um, career at a different Big Ten institution and um, not really knowing what I was doing when I started, I, I um, happened into a great group of people who are at similar stages and we realized very quickly that we were all very diverse but yet we all had something that we could contribute to the others and so we, we started meeting on a weekly basis um, primarily just to gripe about all the senior faculty in our department, <laughs> which, but, you know, the there, there's, I believe that there's a clear reason you want to do that. Um, but it soon turned into a lot of research collaborations, and we kind of started to learn about which, what each person brought. And I really loved that that um, group um, to give me a diverse opinion. And so, if I had a proposal, I would bring that to the group, and I would say. You know, I, do you understand what I'm trying to do? Because you know, I had a, a guy with a physics background who was doing neuroimaging, and if he could understand what I was doing with drugs, then I was probably getting my point across. And so, you know, this is back when it was really drilled into me: you need to be independence, independence, independence. And there was nothing about teams at all. And so I think, just I really learned to appreciate that. And so when I came here, I just started asking people, I'm looking for this person, I'm looking for this person, I'm looking for this person, and it just, I just became very persistent and finally found the right group of people. And, you know, we've been successful together for the last, I think I've been here seven years. So it's just, it's, I think Michigan is extremely siloed. I think we just, you just need to be persistent and you can, you can tear down those silos. That's for sure. Yeah. In her 17 years. How about you? Thank you. Right. So I will say that I um, started out with a very much an organic relationship. I asked a question to who now is my long-term uh, collaborator, who um, had the same idea uh, serendipitously uh, at, with me, but we wanted to approach it from two different aspects. He's a cell and molecular biologist and also an endocrinologist, but approaches things from the basic science research side of things, and I approach size things from the more uh, clinical side of things, and we came together. And it took three years to build a very, um, and I will just brag, successful program. And then people came to us. So a lot of hard work, but um, our, we have 15 different collaborations or collaborators who either use our cohort or biological samples or both. Um, so it was a unique relationship. Um, part of the reason we have so many um, 
collaborations is because because of our different approaches um, and we are very open uh, to collaboration we made it an essential component to our program and to our mission to reach out um, but that that's not necessarily um, what everybody does I would say uh, that's been one of the frustrations uh, that we have had um, so I'll just tell you there are some downsides not everybody wants to be participatory um, and I think um, those people um, frankly can be encouraged to be participatory so if you say if somebody says no to you I would sort of go back at a different time and approach it maybe a little bit differently because um, I think it can swing people so, so I guess to that point, um, it takes time to build a team, that's what we heard. Um, in, in your experiences, um, how much did a mentor help you? you know, was there someone here that, you know, whether you just moved here or whether you were here already, um, <coughs> helped you get into those teams? And, and maybe that relationship in building the team might have been important, either to be close to or to separate from you. I think that's something a lot of young investigators struggle with. So my mentors didn't actually help at all. <laughs> so um, my, I, I love my mentors, but the um, but but they weren't very helpful with that, right? So I, and I think partly there's a generational issue, right? So, I mean, so one of the things is is if you have a, you know if you have a really silver-haired you know you know world-renowned expert on something that you've been training with, that person is trained in the model where they you know built it, they, you know, and that was their thing, right? And so um, so I, the you know, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that you know, so the the the, the problem the, the problem with mentors is that oftentimes mentors have have sort of come into their experience in a in a slightly lagged you know time, and and so so that so the way they may sort of think about things, may, the way they may approach things, may be a little anachronistic, right? It doesn't mean that they're not experts, but it but it's different, right? And so I actually I I, I think it was really sort of out of necessity, and I think a little bit. For, for my own purposes, you know, I started to reach out because I was bored, right? And it's like, you know, it's like, if I see one more blot, I'm going to go hang myself, right? It's like, I just can't take it, right? And it's like, I want something different than that. And, and so a part of it was just like, you know, you, you just get tired of seeing the same old stuff and say, show me something I've never seen before. And, and then it becomes, and then that becomes interesting. But to find stuff you've never seen before, you have to go places you've never gone before. So, but I think it was more about just looking for something new than it was having been trained to, you know, to, you know, to, to sort of act like that. So I think um, my mentor didn't mentor me in the sense of um, you know, learning um, new things about what we do. It was more of um, uh, networking. I mean, he really uh, knew a lot of people and he facilitated a lot of uh, relationships that have now been enduring. Um, so I think in that way, he was very, very helpful, continues to be extre extremely helpful. But I think it was a, um, a shared relationship. Uh, he tells me I'm his boss, but, you know, um, I, I don't know. I, 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 like, like John, I, I don't know that I got taught anything by him other than um, how to network. So, so some sponsorship. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good word. That's fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to echo some of the other comments, I felt like the development of the teams that I've been in were also organic, they're also, they're also driven by questions. And for me, I, I've experienced a lot of mentorship within these team structures, you know, especially if you have a multidisciplinary group. Um, I'm learning and being mentored in content uh, from colleagues in physics or in, or in other disciplines or people who might be more senior even, even within uh, my own discipline, but uh, I felt like a lot has not come from the traditional dyadic mentorship, but more this team structure and, and peer mentorship and people <coughs> making contributions to the group. So um, it, that has been my experience. So I actually, um, my, my postdoc mentor and I were in a very competitive type relationship. So to say that that person helped me is not true. Um, and so that's where I really valued the kind of peer mentoring that I, that I received. But once I came here, um, you know, we had an, a great associate dean that just really helped to open up a lot of doors for me. And I'd say, you know, I'm kind of looking for this type of person. Who do you recommend? And this person had been at Michigan for a really long time. 
because I felt like I needed this chip implanted that would tell me all about Michigan that everyone else knew, but I didn't. Um, and so that really helped, and, and I think that helped me achieve things a lot faster than if I just was doing cold calls and knocking on doors. So I think having that person at answer your institution is, is really helpful. I have a question with George. George, you have a lab, and you also do clinical research. Well, that's, that's I'm looking pretty much right now, trying to figure out those two. But with a lab, and um, when you start, you know you don't have some funding, kind of how to, how, how did you start? Um, you build up your lab. Um, just, yeah, that's a great question. Um, because I was 50% clinical, and I was also a division director when I started, I mean, it's a small division, it's not like an internal medicine. Um, I definitely knew I needed people who were there full time yeah. in the lab and so I used my startup funds um, to, I mean, first I was working in, in structures and groups of others, uh, but then, you know, when we got our own space, I, I used startup funds to have a lab manager there, somebody who had experience in, in the kinds of things that I was doing or interested in. Uh, and then getting a, a senior postdoc, somebody who already had a lot of experience. Uh, so that's how I leveraged that that startup package to get people who were there full time, who had experience, who um, could do well yeah. with me coming in, helping to set direction, having intellectual discussions, but not necessarily being there all the time. Um, so that's how things got started. For me, uh, we just—I've been faculty now for almost six and a half years. We just got our first graduate student because I wanted to wait until we had the appropriate structure within the lab to that a grad student would have that kind of support and attention. So, started out using funds to get more <coughs> senior-level postdocs, lab managers, people who could survive and thrive with with me just setting direction rather than being there. All the day. And uh, so once you get that, you start to write grants. Right. When, when do you start to do that? Because of course, so I, uh, I I wrote a grant. I uh, I got my first foundation grant within six months of being faculty. It was a half million dollar grant. It was for clinical research. Um, I then turned that into uh, applying for one of the Mister K. Uh, the KL2 program, which then clinical and translational, um, and then from that went to an R01, uh, which included both includes both basic science and human volunteer aims. So, which is kind of a, I'd say pretty typical, starting out with a foundation, hopefully a, a major foundation grant, moving to some kind of K level award, uh, and then moving to an R series award. So, so what point did you decide in your development that you needed to form teams? Well, I, I knew for me, I mean, it's really, you know, I knew how ignorant I was, I mean, quite simply. And I had certain concepts about the way I thought consciousness was working and about the way I thought general anesthetics interrupted consciousness. I had very clear concepts that I, I knew that I needed quantitative tools um, to help really study and advance those concepts. And so, um, again, sort of an organic connection with this uh, physicist, Dr. Unchul Lee, who's now a faculty in my lab. He was doing a postdoc um, at one of the Max Planck Institutes in, in Germany. And we started communicating by email. And I realized he had this uh, great set of tools in terms of network science and, and graph <coughs> theory. And I had all these concepts. Um, and, and, and so, like, of course, many teams, we, we're offering something to each other, and we, we knew that working together, that we would be able to accomplish something. So I, I, I knew that I needed help, and I needed a specific kind of expertise. And I also have a, I mean, I'm just, I'm interested in other fields, and I'm interested in hearing about experts, uh, and their content expertise, and, and learning from that, I mean, it makes it very dynamic. Um, and so I wanted to to build a, a multidisciplinary group to, to approach the question. But again, starting with a question, having a vision, but also recognizing that I was completely ignorant in terms of how I was going to translate my ideas into to quantitative science. 
Because I didn't. Um, <coughs> in fact, you know, the, the problem is that I don't know how to, I don't know how to define team. That was actually the first question I got asked when I was asked to do this. So I don't know what you're talking about. So, um, but but if you if you say that if you say that you know that that you know the team that the team related work is something that, that sort of falls outside of that normal sort of you know I'm going to build a lab I'm going to hire you know employees at various levels I'm going to sort of start writing grants I'm going to start my work if you say the teamwork is, some, is somehow different from that I think you I think it is I'm just not exactly sure how to define it um, I, I'd already I'd already been funded with a K and an R01 and I'd already you know gotten an advanced degree before I even started thinking about it and my my foray into team science was a mistake it was I had a data set um, and and I you know I I'd love to do stats and I did, had a data set that was confounding me and I and I said what I need is a mathematician and that was not what I needed um, but that's what I thought I needed and so I and so I went over and actually gave a seminar in the math department and to see you know here's the problem I, I basically just pitched the problem and 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 the idea in a couple within a couple of years exploded, and we had we had quickly had NH money to support supplemental work related to doing the math. I did a year of sabbatical in the math department here, and um, and it wasn't even the guys I was looking for, but it was it was a good match. And um, and then quickly the other sort of experts in the physical sciences sort of followed. But it was um, but it was it was really just sort of when you stumbled upon something in your work where you said the way that I would approach this is not the best way to approach it, and what can I do instead? Um, and and because. I mean, for a lot of things, you know, if you force it, you know, if you force that peg through a round hole, it will go. But it's not very satisfying, right? So I, we just had data that was that was a problem, and, and I and I should have gone to the stats department, but I went to the math department instead, and, and it worked it worked out very effectively. But it was not, it was it was well into my career, I think, before I started thinking about that. So so maybe at this point, since we're here, maybe I can pitch a question that uh, was supplied by one of the participants when they registered. Uh, and I don't know who that was, and, um, but as a young scientist, I don't know how to trust others in the cutthroat academic environment. How do you pick trustworthy collaborators? And if you must work with those who are known to be difficult, how do you handle that? And I think that's something that you know, we've, we've all encountered. And, you know, if you the audience, too, I mean, or the participants, if, you know, speak up about this because you probably, my guess is, are encountering this as we speak. I'll, I'll tell you from a sex perspective, because I do think there are differences between women and men, so no offense to you, to the men, but, so, uh, um, you know, and I don't particularly like conflict, uh, and, and so I avoid it at all costs, but that has actually hurt me, and I will just tell you a very negative story and then uh, what I did to change that. I think it's incredibly important for everybody to be transparent about your own hypothesis up front and what your expectations, particularly with authorship or how you want to, if you have the idea, of if it's a clinical study, how you want to conduct that study. Uh, you being honest will facilitate a, a lot of other, or uh, reduce other problems. But um, I took a hypothesis to a another division um, because I was going to need their help because I needed that patient population to do this clinical trial. And they were all very excited and engaged and I said, but I will do the intervention because only I can do this particular intervention. That was my expertise. And they were gung-ho. This turned out to be the subject of an R01 and another national network um, grant on which I was put as a consultant. And that was, I turned to my mentor collaborator who also networked with these people and said, you need, you now need to fix this. Now, I mean, I, I felt like I, I just you know, couldn't stand up to, to, the, to these potential collaborators. And the problem was actually rectified because the national network uh, did not get funded. And so the, the R01 has been moving forward, it will be submitted, um, but um, because of the results of that, n of that uh, not getting funded, uh, they've come to understand how valuable the component, which was the, my original hypothesis was, and that I will now serve as the PI. Can I follow up on your uh -huh. story? So you're talking about making things transparent, which I've heard again and again. 
Um, how do you determine authorship issues ahead of time, which we're all advised to do, when you're doing something new, you're working with people new, there's new things to be discovered, so you don't actually know, you know, what papers you're going to wind up writing. So I'm curious about how do you stake your claim <coughs> in things when you can't really say, I am, you know, the paper is going to be A, B, and C, because you're doing new work that you don't really know. Does that make sense? Well, I don't know if I have um, a precise answer to that, but I will just give you another example. So I collaborate with somebody from neuroscience, from psychiatry and neuroscience, and uh, we do the intervention and the recruiting, and he does the interesting imaging. And we establish right off the bat that um, if he's writing about imaging, he's going to be the primary author, and I will be the second author on it, but that it would be, sh that we would write that this was shared um, writing. <coughs> That, you know, you have to push someone, one and two, um, but that was the delegation, and that you know that seems fair. If I'm contributing more to the paper because we're writing more about the intervention itself and you know, about the sort of survey questionnaires, then I would be first okay. author. It's not necessarily how much you write. You know, if you wrote the whole paper, it's just how much. Was it you know, that consumes your life in terms of getting out this particular publication? Or I think there's another there's another thing as well. So a lot of people early on, I mean, <coughs> manuscripts I think get overemphasized as the unit of currency for yeah. for the interaction. And there's there's a, yeah, it's important. You you don't want to undersell how important manuscripts are. But ma ma manuscripts aren't everything. And, and the honest to god truth is, in the course of your academic year. You know, if, if someone else, you know, says, well, I'll just push this paper out the door and you just get to ride along with it while you're doing other stuff, sometimes that's okay. <laughs> like, yeah. thank you for not making me be senior author on this paper. So, um, but but I think that the the, the, the issue that I've, I've sort of encountered that I think is, so I, I completely agree with the transparency. When stuff goes bad, and stuff can go really bad, um, it doesn't happen very often, but stuff can go really bad um, in, in interactions that, yeah. Where, where trust gets violated and people start to take stuff personally. But, but, um, but I think that what's, what's really important is when you sit down with someone you haven't worked with before is that you need to understand what it is that they need, right? And so, so you know, if you sit down with a tenured professor, they're going to be kind of bored with this conversation about who's senior author a lot of the time. That's not really what they need, right? There's something else that they enter into these conversations for, and, and that the same is true if you're interacting with a student, right? What the student needs out of their interaction with you is different than what, you know, what the <coughs> professor needs. And so, and so I, it, my collaborators and I, at least once a year, will dedicate a meeting to simply talking about our own careers and stuff that we need in our careers and how the interactions are sort of feeding into that, right? Because there are, there's like, right now there's, you know, there's, I have a, a collaborator who's going up for tenure in mathematics in, at the University of Colorado, and the last two papers that we've worked on together have really been pointing towards making sure that that happens, mm -hmm. right? And so, and, and so it's important for the team, and so that, and so, you know, the authorship decisions are being driven by larger needs within the group, rather than just saying, well, who's going to get credit for this idea? And, and so thinking, understanding what people need, where they are in their careers, do they need money for a graduate student, do they need another paper, do they need evidence that they're driving a grant in order to get promoted, you know, do they want to be in the National Academy of Sciences, what is it that people want? And how is the team going to move all those goals forward? And I think that then you can put co papers in context, and you can start the sort of the more detailed conversation about who's first, who's last. And I think that what we do is we try to be flexible. And, and we, my lab does sort of what Amy's group does is to say that there's some domains that you're going to own, and there's some domains that I'm going to own. And if we publish in your domain, your you know your folks are going to be first and last author, and my folks won't be. And if we go in my domain, my first you know I'll be last. One of my guys will be first, and, and we'll do it that way. Um, it, sometimes you, you, that can get a little bit clunky, but for the most part, uh, it, you know, if you're really collaborating with someone that knows something very different than you, then chances are they're publishing somewhere different than you as well. Um, and then, the, and then it becomes easier to sort of divvy up, you know, ownership of the of the territory because you can say, you know, this person needs to make a name in their field; they should be last author in that paper, right? Because it's going into that field, right? So you don't, you don't, like, I don't need to make a name for myself in chemical engineering because don't. And so, if we do something in chemical engineering, I'm fine. Just let that go, right? And so, um, and, but it, but but 
you have to have rules. You have to have an understanding of what everyone needs. Um, it, you know, it's a little bit weird. You know, the first time you bring up the conversation, it's a little bit weird. So it's like kissing on the first date, right? You say, you know, hey, you, can I talk to you about how you did this Western? And by the way, who do you want to be first author? So you, so you get it's a little bit hard. But but within a couple dates, you need to be kissing. Right? You need to sort of figure it out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a great title. A great title for an article. Topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think too it's an evolving conversation because I agree with you. You know, we have manuscripts come up all the time that we never envisioned would have come up, and so then it's going back and saying, "Hey, we're we have this data, or we're thinking of writing this and then having okay. that conversation." But you know, I have horror stories too, um, just like Amy does, and and I think I don't. I'm a non-physician, so that too also I think adds to. Um, where I sometimes place on the team, um, but I hope that, and, and this goes to the back to the question. I hope that um, people don't take this as um, being that you shouldn't try to have these relationships because I think what you gain from having these teams and having these collaborations is much more. I think you get a lot out of it versus being too afraid to collaborate with someone. Um, although, if, if if you're working with someone and it's it's not clicking and it's yeah. not going well, listen to your gut um, to see how things go. Because yeah. I think I think you just need to learn how to listen to your gut. And you know, I'm a good Lutheran from Minnesota <laughs> who doesn't like conflict and is really good at passive aggressive stuff. So um, <laughs> I've I you know I still like last week I just took my emotional intelligence test and I didn't do so great on that. So <laughs> I have I, I that's that conflict <laughs> resolution <laughs> skill <laughs> thing is something I constantly purposefully work at. Okay. Because I know it will make me a better scientist. Yeah, I have a, I, I'm a psychologist <coughs> by sorry, training. Claire, I want you to introduce yourself. Claire, oh, I'm, I'm a in physical medicine rehabilitation and I'm a rehab psychologist although I haven't practiced in a long time. And I was, th I, of course, I think a lot about social skills because that matters a whole lot in making your team work or not work. And I, I'm somebody that everybody talks to, so I'm always in the middle of. I hear both sides of the story, and I try to be neutral. And um, but in fact, this issue came up with me just last week. Um, I have a R1. I have a team I'm building for an R1 application, and uh, one of my mentors moved to the university that I'm also clamoring with. So I'm like writing the justification like who's the PI at that site? I'm like, oh man. And so I had a conversation with my mentor who we worked a while. Well now it turns out that like he and this person at the site aren't getting along well. I'm like, oh, now that's become my problem. <laughs> and and so to your point about honesty, I'm just talking to him honestly. Because I don't have time to I can't negotiate their relationship. Um, and I can see both sides of it, so I'm talking to both of them. Ultimately, I'm probably going to have to decide, but it's it's a burden when you can't get along with people, and then it becomes other people's problem. But I think that, in a way, um, I'm not so conflict averse, uh, but I also almost pretend like I don't know that people are problems, and I sort of treat them like I don't know that they're difficult. <laughs> um, and I don't have a lot of patience for being difficult, difficult people that make life hard for others. But, um, but I think the ability, it, that those social skills, the ability to connect to others on levels beyond the science, right? So you almost be, you become friends. Um, I think helps a lot when you have to negotiate some of these tricky waters um, of, um, because a lot of it is negotiating your own relationships and sometimes you get caught in the middle of others. But just being honest, I think in the end, so tactful, but honest at the same time. And no surprises. So collaborators don't like to be surprised, right? Yeah. Just like something happens. Like I, I screwed this up recently. I've collaborated with mine for a long time. One of his grad students did a couple assays for us one day, so I threw him on this paper, you know. And then my collaborator's like, "Well, you know, when he goes on papers, I go on papers." Like, mm -hmm. ooh, sorry. Mm -hmm. So wow. yeah. So little things, right? So just yeah. no surprises, right? Right. So it's right. And apologize for this stuff. I'd like to address one thing because I think John's message that he gave early on about you know manuscripts don't matter. I think, and, and he came back and said that they do matter if you're really <laughs> stage investigating. Yes, right? yes, so, yes, so they definitely matter to you. And, and I think there is a question about how do you get credit for team science? And, and you know George was on a panel just recently at the provost's office, same panel I was on, 
or the discussion campus wide was, you know, how do you judge team science? Um, you know, we've addressed it here in the medical school by allowing people to include that in their, in their promotion portfolio or promotion package. Um, but I think, and George, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the answer from across campus was, yes, it's value added, but you still need to show some independence. And so that's going to be really important in a team. Um, is that what you got out of that session? Yes. And, and I think one answer came up in terms of, you know, what do people need from this interaction, like from a career perspective? Um, what domain is this work going to be uh, exposed to? I mean, I think that definitely can help guide sharing the credit. Do you mind if I take one step back? Yeah, no, yeah, um, it, with a lot of things we're talking about and, you know, with this expectations, team communication, transparency, basically everything in those lines, to me, boils down to leadership. And I think that's an important question and concept to be thinking about, whatever stage uh, you're in. It, it's, now, now, sometimes there's this amazing organic, you know, it's like all the ants, or have, you know, there's some emergent phenomenon that comes from them independently doing their thing. It, it doesn't always work like that, okay? And having somebody who is clearly a leader doesn't mean that everybody else is their minions, <laughs> going, going back to the earlier uh, comment, but that somebody is in a leadership position and has leadership skills because these are leadership, they're not scientific skills, conflict resolution, establishing expectations, communications, they're what we need to do good signs. But I think as a junior level person looking, asking the question, who is leading? What kind of leadership skills do they have? That's also gonna help guide your decision to join this team or not. And if you're more senior asking yourself, as I do sometimes, am I functioning appropriately as a leader uh, in terms of helping this facilitating things for this team. Um, I've had collaborations, and we had one recently, with good friends, uh, multiple experts, no shortage of talent. It was painful. It was painful. And one of the reasons why it was painful, and reflecting on it afterwards, is because nobody clearly took ownership of that project. We, because I think we all wanted to be like, well, so-and-so is an expert in this, and she's an expert in this. But we suffered because it wasn't clear who's really going to help facilitate that. And it doesn't mean that they always need to be the leader. But as the team's moving forward, I think it's really critical um, to identify who's, who's leading, who's going to help uh, navigate some of these more difficult situations. And when you're junior, evaluating those skills in others, and when you're senior, reflecting on your own abilities. So I just wanted to put that out there. I think you can take leadership in certain aspects because I think sometimes we think of leadership as like the project, but really you can take leadership in certain domains of a, uh, a project or as a team functions. You know, when you say leadership, are you talking about clearly defined, you know, the project itself? Because I'm thinking about if you are more junior, of looking for opportunities to show leadership in. A certain aspect of a problem, whether it's you know human subjects or regulatory, you know what I mean. Sure. Well, there, I mean, there's going to be content expertise. I mean, I certainly, you know, I'm depending on members of my team for that content expertise. Um, but I think sometimes when things are very difficult, it's because nobody's really yeah. taking ownership of the process. Again, it doesn't mean they're telling people what to do. Um, but in, in facilitating these types of things, those early expectations, transparency, communication, um, I, I think they have to come from somewhere and they have to be um, evaluated as the process is unfolding. Has anyone worked with industry before? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, industry actually has a great concept. They have project managers <laughs> over there. It's not the investigators necessarily. So, so you as a, as a early stage investigator, could essentially become the project manager and manage the, the, the program. Right. I mean, most PIs aren't very good at this, quite honestly. Yeah. So um, if you have skills at that area, I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't take care of that. That's sort of what I was thinking, yeah. yeah. And I think, it's, it, as has been indicated, it's really important to have that person as the project manager to maintain the continuity and the 
uh, in the relationships. You know, even bringing stuff up that is a problem no one wants to talk about is probably something that's important. I think the, the, the other side of the coin is as you are developing uh, leadership skills, um, you have to remember that you also have to delegate. So I, you know, I, I was very bad. I had to do everything myself. And I just had, in order to just have control, but there were far superior people <laughs> who could do the things that I, I thought I could do. And so that's also part of the learning process, is learning to sort of <clears throat> give up some of your control in favor of actually better um, or greater expertise. Yeah, I, would, um, I just want to go back to this question that was originally posed. So I, I would say two things. I, I've been here for 19 years. I have not found this to be a cutthroat environment. And um, that's because you're a law physician. <laughs> I don't know. What, I don't know what that means. So, um, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> but um, but I, I've not found it to be very cutthroat. I found this this place to be a, a really remarkable in your ability to just sort of knock on somebody's door and, and have an expectation that at least you'll be spoken to. Um, now, whether or not someone's going to, you know. You know, breed rats for you. That's another thing. But, but, but I haven't, I haven't actually found it cutthroat. But that said, um, there are definitely jerks at the University of Michigan, right? So I, I, so they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Um, but they're not. Um, almost hardly anybody is. But, but, but there are people out there that, that for some reason or another, you're not going to be able to work with them. And life is short. And my advice is mostly just don't, just don't, right? And uh, if it's not working, just it's, I don't. I don't really know of anybody at this institution that does something that no one else in the institution does, right? So where is the unique skill in this institution? It's really hard to think about what would that one thing be. Um, there's you know there's um, redundancy in almost every expertise here, and so um, so you know so I think that you that if there's some so I don't know if there's anyone you have to work with unless you're told you have to work with them. Um, but that said, um, I think that you might find that there are, that there are places where you all sort of wander that you can sort of take root and say this is actually a really you know productive thing. And there's other places where you won't take root, and you'll migrate towards the things that succeed over time. And, and so it may be that the reason why I don't think there's a lot of jerks here is because I wander away from people I don't get along with, and and you know and, and wander towards people that I do. But 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 conflict is conflict that's happening like right out of the gate. You have to be really careful about because conflict. Most of the time, it just stuff just falls apart, and that's fine, right? So if the collaboration just stops, no one, you know, everyone just is done working. That's one thing. But when it when it explodes, um, um, there's lots of there are lots of issues, and, and especially as a junior person, um, you can find yourself in an extremely asymmetric power relationship with someone who may be very mad, um, and you have to be very cautious. And you need to make sure that you have someone that has your back. Uh, when that happens, um, but I don't think you should live in fear of that. I think you should just know that things sometimes bad things happen for reasons that can be inexplicable. But, but I, I haven't found it to be um, I haven't found it to be that um, aggressive of an environment. I think that it's pretty easy to work here. So. I wanted to go back to the, the um, manuscript and talk about promotion. So um, I think the word team science. Um, is new. It's the you know the new PC term. I always laugh because if you work in a hospital long enough, you've seen several iterations of do we have tile all over the floor? Do we have carpet all over the floor? <laughs> and you're like, well, we're on a we're on a we're on a tile cycle now. We're on, and I think this is what happens with science too. It was collaboration. You know, now we're in team science. I don't know what it's going to be next. I don't. But um, I think one of the things that I'm really really learning. Um, is that if you are entering into a team science and you are a junior person, you're going to have to potentially manage up to your department chair and make sure that they understand the importance of this. And the reason I say that is because uh, in the College of Pharmacy, we just recently had an experience where we had two junior uh, people going up for promotion. They were collaborating on the same grant. One was, one was the PI, the other one was a collaborator. And we could not tell if this person was an essential collaborator and this person couldn't have gotten the R01, if this other person wasn't on it and nowhere was it explained and we couldn't. And so unfortunately the person with the R01 got promoted, the person without the R01 did not get promoted. And so I think you need to really, because this is kind of a new concept and the, the concept of dual you know, primary authors is new and the co-PIs is all new. I think you really need to 
set these expectations and if, if you're having that yearly evaluation talk about what your contributions are so that when you go up for promotion it is crystal clear that you bring a very unique science to this proposal or this grant and that without you it would not occur and I think that the three-year review for um, for instructional track faculty, you know, so that so one of the associate deans or assistant deans, assistant deans will come through the three years and sort of say, how's it going? Those are great questions, right? You just need to make a paper trail, right? So I think that you know, in that instance, I think that the promoted junior faculty member needs to get in the chair's office that day and say, wait a minute, you know, my partner is getting left behind. Yeah, they're married too. Oh, so that so that's it. That is, yeah, that's a different thing. That's really a mistake. That, that's that's a that's a yeah. That's an administrative mistake by the promotion system because that because those those are un, you can un, un, untangle those and you just yeah. yeah. You that so to this point, you as faculty, and I'm going to put on my faculty affairs hat and say that to your, you have to manage your careers, yeah. not just in team science, you know, independence, all of those things, um, and and as far as a promotion package. You know, you have you should be managing that promotion package and make sure the right information gets in there. You know, when the time comes. And again, the third year review is really important. Um, you know, independent outside of your department. You know, how am I doing? I'm doing team science. You know, am I doing this right? Those are you know the questions you need to ask not only locally in your department but but at the dean's office as well. Yeah, I'm gonna. Um Follow up on something that Vicky said as well. So, so one of the things that I, over time, have become very sensitive to, and and really, and everyone that works with me sort of knows what the etiquette is for this. So, so um, how many people here are, are, are clinicians, or have some, are physicians, or do some some patient care? I mean, so actually, not a lot. So that's that's interesting. So, so one of the one of the biggest problems I think you can int introduce into. Um, into a collaboration with someone outside of the medical center is is the fact that that you work on some disease, right? Especially if you're a clinician, right? So um, so that introduces this sort of weird, untrumpable asymmetry in the relationship where it's like no matter what they know, yeah, but I take care of really super sick people, and then that somehow wins no matter what, right? And so like so our rules for engagement when we are you know in the lab when we have any research meetings, so pagers come off, we never never wear a white coat, never talk shop. So I I talk, I'm teaching a class with one of my collaborators up on North Campus this semester, and we. We had a day where we actually talked shop. I just talked about medicine for a day, and it's the first time in six years we've ever talked about what I do clinically. And I think that understanding that uh, for people that don't that have some expertise that, that may be in mathematics, maybe in a physical science, it's understanding that um, that that. Um, no matter what you do, the fact that you're working on, on disease and that there's this sort of magical, well, it could kill you sort of thing, that that, that, that sets up this this thing where where it where it, it makes the relationship not as productive as I think it could be. And, it, and especially for like students, right? So if you have a you know you know, if you're in the lab and there's grad students working around you that are gonna make, you know, one third of the salary you, you make when they're like at the top of their pay scale and, and you know, you're answering patients, pages and things like that, that is that's all highly disruptive. And I think that trying to separate any any sort of you know let the science be the science but be very careful about how you sort of appear and what what happens in terms of you know being a physician because I know because because the word on the street and, and I've, I've had this told to me bluntly and, and I, I totally believe it is the word on the street is you know this institution if you collaborate with someone in the medical school expect to do all the work and expect to not be last author and true uh, yeah. you know, I, I have not had that experience. But you, but you, but I have my you own can't, be, right, and, you right, know, right, but you I, can't, you know, but you can imagine that experience, right? Yes, so I think that, I definitely can. Yeah, so I think that thinking about that as well, and that and that collaborate when you collaborate very far afield, that that there's this human health is, is sort of really comfortable to us and we talk, we deal with it all the time but to other specialties other expertise it's all very foreign it can be very creepy and worrisome and people don't know how to sort of imagine it right and so so being very thoughtful about um, about you know what face you take to those collaborations I think is you know just be very respectful and understand that you're really you know potentially in extremely different circumstances in terms of what you know and what you do and those things so how many people here are from outside the medical school how many folks here resonate to that? I mean, is that? I mean, I mean, so so to the other side, what do you do if you're a PhD interacting with a clinician or someone that um, you know 
Vicky? Well, I mean, so, you know, I was in clinical practice until I came here, so, but, you know, I'm not a physician, I'm a pharmacist. Um, you you kind of get a read. There are some physicians here that um, I've been in meetings with where I'm like, okay, that person's a jerk. You know, you just, you can kind of... That's, that's, just, that's both sides. I mean, it is both sides. You just, you, I mean, oh, yeah, <coughs> oh, I can name as many PhDs that are yeah. exactly the same way, too. Um, I think it's, I think it's just, I think it's, I don't know, it's, it's organic. You just kind of, I don't, I don't know how to put this into words. You just, you just, okay, that person, I'm not going to work with that person unless I absolutely have to. And I have been in situations where I've been on mentoring teams with some people that are jerks. Um, and I will then often take the mentor afterwards and say, okay, this person was not so nice to you. Let's talk about that. Is that okay? Is that relationship okay? Because I don't, I don't really have to have a relationship with this person, but the person that we mentor together has to have a relationship. So that's what I'm more concerned about. But, so any yeah. participants have the well, questions uh, regarding that? Or? I, I came here from, I'm a statistician, and I came here from the clinical affairs here at the large medical device company. So I'm, I'm, I'm staff here, which I think is obviously a different situation but I would say you know I I, I always uh, I enjoyed working with with with, uh, with physician PIs you know when I was with uh, Boston Scientific and, and I, I, I like my boss a lot here and I like the environment and, but it's it's different the hospital itself and being in you know kind of working in this uh, uh, university health system it's yeah, I, I totally resonate with what, what you were saying, uh, Jared. It's, it's like uh, um, you can call me John. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it's, it's, it's different. There is that that aspect to you know that there, you know, and and I, I, I I'm yeah, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with the power structure. You know, I think I'm. I, it's, a, it's it's great to be able to participate. Yeah, and and, and actually, I don't perceive myself as a minion at all. Yeah. You know, I made the decision to come here, and it's because there's an opportunity to do more interesting work here. Um, so anyway, to answer answer the question, I think it's like it's something I think that you know, it, 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 uh, or it's not, there wasn't necessarily a question, but it, I think it's it's important to be aware of those I am. Uh, so, yeah, folks here from the dental school. Yeah, so I'm glad. Yeah, so I'm from dentistry. Um, I'm a dental scientist, but. Um, I think, you know, some of the tension is that when I look at the professions, they're organized really hierarchically, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And a lot of times, high-functioning teams are not hierarchical. In fact, people yeah, can flexibly idea. assume leadership at different stages of projects and that sort of thing. And, and so if you get outside of the professions, it's less hierarchical, mm -hmm. I think, usually. Not always. I mean, I guess there's no absolute. <laughs> but so, you know, maybe some of the issue with working through, you know, really trying to understand the culture that the team members are coming from and how that might impact how people think about relating to one another. And so that's, you know, and so you have, you know, you have hierarchy generated by level of training, so student, postdoc, you know, professor sort of thing. And, but then you also have these other natural kinds of hierarchies. And I mean, guess, you know, in the ER you have quite a, a hierarchy, right? So there are people re responsible you, for something. No, actually. Yeah. So it actually, it's. I think it's one of the reasons why. I. I mean, I. I think that what I learned, you know, what I learned in the what I learned in the basement is actually pretty useful. That is, is that is that um, is that there are some things you're going to solve single handedly, but many things you will not, and that's just the way it's going to go, right? And you have to be able to sell ice to Eskimos at three in the morning, and that, you know, and so I, I think that. Um, I think, but, but I think that's 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 the exact right thing, right? Is that there's a place, there's a time and a place for a pecking order, and there's a time and a place for sort of let that slide, right? Yeah, and that's yeah. I think exactly. Yeah. Too. I, th I think that's interesting. I was so when I was in clinical practice, I was on a med psych unit, and so it was all patients that had a psych psychiatric illness and a medical illness, and we had two attendings. We had a medicine attending, we had a psychiatry attending, and then we had you know, our, our senior resident, and we had all our interns and stuff, and it was really interesting when we had the two attendings and didn't have just one med site person because neither group wanted to learn about the medications that the other would have. <laughs> and so because of that, I was the nice in between, and they'd be like, oh, this person has this, we want to start this, will you check for drug interactions and come up with a record? So I took care of all the meds. And it was a, you know, so I just got used to having, and, and I agree, a hierarchical really wouldn't work in that situation. 
And so it was really this really nice, I grew up in this really nice team working system where I was responsible mm -hmm. for all the medications on these patients. Um, and then when it was a med psych person, I usually had trained with them, and so they're like, oh, you'll do that? Okay, go, you know, go do that. So it was, it was really great. But I think it's, it's just making sure that your team has the strengths that you need and understanding what everyone's role is. I just one point from the that you were bringing up in terms of the the promotion career development perspective. Um, when we were at that seminar at the Provost office, I was quite surprised by how dramatically different certain schools handle this. They have very very different perspectives. And I think following up on some earlier comments, I think it's important from the outset to have a very clear sense of what those expectations are from the department, uh, from the school, because. People on other teams and other uh, parts of the university may have very, very different rules, uh, number one. And number two, I think also in terms of that career recognition and career development, it's important to keep in mind that it's not just about having a unique skill. And I think one also needs to have unique questions. Um, and I think that's important to evaluate because I, I think one problem with the team science as people are evaluating it is, well, it, was this person just serving a technical role for each of these projects, or were they a, a, a driving force intellectually? Were they asking the questions? Were they driving the ideas? And so I, I think that's something to, to keep in mind and ask yourself as well. Can you give just, you know, without naming the schools, can you give some examples of the expectations of the different schools in terms of the roles that, that you know, what their expectations well, well, I'll bring, I mean, I don't, there's no, I don't think there's anything <laughs> secretive. I mean, well, I was bringing up uh, as a great example in the medical school and clinical research of a statistician as, wow, I mean, we, well, we wouldn't be anywhere with some of these, we do these large database projects in my department. If we did not have statisticians, we'd be going nowhere. And so, their role is critically important and, and we have tremendous value for it. Uh, the School of Public Health, if individuals as statisticians are not actively putting forth their own statistical questions and innovations, um, I mean, that, I mean, they were very clear. I mean, there has to be some um, innovation for them to recognize it in terms of career development. Uh, in my lab, where I have people who have analytic skills that I could, you know, only dream of at some point, you know, there's sometimes when they are the first author or co-author on something that I'm primarily driving, but then there are also innovations that they're developing where I contribute and, and then I let them just run with it. I and mean, it's just similar to what yeah. you're saying because that is going to be important for them uh, and their development. Yeah, I think st statistics, I think, is actually a really great example because it's one of the most, I'm guessing it's one of the most sort of engaged other specialties, right? And um, and I think that you can approach you can approach that as a service line. You can say, this is what I need. Can you get back to me with that? Or you can approach it collaboratively. And those are different relationships with statisticians. I prefer the latter. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one thing, you know, one thing that, you know, that lets you know that you're treating your, your your statistician as a collaborator as opposed to someone who's, you know, sort of like a necessary skill to get something done is, is say, we're going to stop what we're doing right now. We're going to collect data for the next six months because the data are going to have a certain structure that are extremely challenging for the statistician. And we want them to be able to publish on how do you solve this problem. Them, right? And would you would you drive the team towards a, towards a question that really is getting at a paper that will go in the statistics literature? Um, and would you would, would you would you harness the team's power to sort of do something like that? Because there are and those those there are ways of doing that, right? Just saying that we can we can do the study a bunch of different ways. But if we do it this way, the statistician is actually going to come to the fore because it's really a complicated issue analytically, and uh, and, and and so you can make decisions about what you do really to sort of you know to sort of you know key off of those strengths and to really put those people much more in the spotlight than they would be otherwise. And, and I think that that's just and that's just sort of I think you know one of the one of the things I think that gives, I don't know, I don't know what a leader is either, but I think that one of the signs that sort of says that you're leading is that if you say, you know, we're going to, we're going to just, 
we're going to turn the ship a little bit so that this person, you know, that this person's actually driving, right? And uh, and I think that that's just, I think you just have, they have to be thoughtful and look for those opportunities and again, understand what, what it is, that, you know, what it is that that person needs, right? So what would be the sweet data set that they would never see otherwise? What's the, the study design, the study design that will raise holy hell in their specialty that they really want to work on, right? And I think those are, those are just questions you have to ask. That's, that's a great point. Any of these projects, I mean, specifically with that kind of, analytic data relationship is sort of like a Necker cube where you're either seeing it as you're, you're pulling in this analytical prowess to help solve a question within the data set or you're using the data set to help advance um, something in, in the analytic realm and, and that's we've kind of had that at least in my group had that interplay which has been gratifying. I guess you know, with respect to observational data and understanding causal framework, you know, I think in, in some ways of collaboration with uh, uh, clinical specialties or experts in other fields, it's fundamentally important that, you know, because it's not, I mean, I would say the statistician's role of study design, right, it can be enormously creative. I am um, very interested in, in quality improvement generally and in observational research yeah, uh, I should, observational research generally quality improvement specifically, and with respect to those, you know, you know, those challenges, I think it's like the 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 the, the where I see uh, the real value of this, you know, the, of collaboration is is determining, you know, uh, 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 essentially. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm droning on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not at all. But I think I think it's like un, un, being able to, in, in absence of. The ability to create an experiment, being able to clearly specify what the the, uh, the hypothesis is and you know what what the your causal assumptions are, and then to build uh, and then de develop methodology to test those causal assumptions is you know I, how I see my role. You know, it's like it's not uh, and, and that's because I'm not an academic, right? So I I think even with within this idea that you know here. Is um, uh, a technical skill and, a, uh, and a t essentially a technician who is employed in the process of developing research. There's enormous creativity there, or there's the at least from my perspective, I see the potential for enormous creativity. And so, anyway, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll, I'm done. No, 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 it's great. No, I mean, you're bringing up, so we do this like observational type research. It, the science is statistics, I mean, the data are already there, right? And so um, it, it's absolutely essential. But the question is, from the perspective of the, the school or whatever you know, school you're in, uh, the, the promotion committee is, how, do you, how is that most clearly demonstrated? Um, and it doesn't mean that everybody has to be first author on everything, but in making sure that one's sensitive to the, to the fact that there are, there, in, in some places here, people could have very, very different criteria and expectations with respect to how you show that kind of creativity and input. I, I like I like participating in authorship, I like being on papers, but I think from my perspective it's like being able to clearly communicate my market worth. <laughs> so that a skill set that's, you know, potentially applicable to other areas, you know. So I think I, I think sometimes when you and maybe this is the end, is if but, you're dealing with non academic collaborators. That's right. But it depends on what market you're in. Right? I mean, the market worth can be one thing. If the market that you're in is thinking about academic promotion, then the currency is something else. Yeah. Um, so, I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> so, I'd like to, I'd like to move, move on or continue with one other aspect, and that's how do you identify your collaborators? And I, and I think that's really important because it is organic. And, and I think having the panel address, and, and to this point, Chris Black from the Office of Research They've generated one way, and I think all of campus can use this. Oh, it's public. Right? And, it, and it's across campus. Right. Yeah, what well, we're talking about, um, SciVal uh, experts, which we now call uh, Michigan experts, and it's an Elsevier tool. And there's probably, gosh, a couple dozen or 30 or so uh, universities across the country who use it. And it's an expertise database. Wayne State uses it, Michigan State uses it. But um, you can search this database by either concept or name. And then when you get into the database and you find an expert, you can find like experts outside of the University of Michigan also. And so it's a very powerful tool. Um, and um, so, so far I can tell you the partners are 
um, medicine, dentistry, um, pharmacy, public health, LSI, engineering, um, uh, U of M, Dearborn, Omtree, uh, I think there's, there's eight of them, and I might have forgotten that somewhere along the line, nursing, just nursing. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, so there's about 3,300 fact to profiles in there that include um, the um, expertise based on expertise fingerprinting based on publications mainly, many publications, but also grants and patents. So anyway, it's a powerful tool. We hope you use it, and we are hoping to expand it also on campus. So um, you know, if you know of anybody, any of your collaborators who you feel should be in it, I would love to see ISR in it, for example. I think that would be really, really helpful. And Allison A, of course. Um, but um, but anyway, it started to medical school, and we have expanded it. And um, we really like to get campus. Now this isn't easy because you'll get a list of a hundred people, yeah. right? So there's there's work to be done, and um, you know perhaps a hundred people. Um, so back to the panel, how do you identify who's going to be a good collaborator? I mean, not necessarily just using that tool, but I, I do think, as you have said before, it's more organic. I mean, I I go to talks that are interesting, not necessarily in my division, and then I think. Wow, that's fantastic. I'm going to email or talk to this person after that lecture. I think I have identified a way to collaborate and uh, I engage that person. I mean, that, that's uh, how I formed most, most of the relationships that I've uh, formed. So, um, I don't know. And I'm a clinician. So I spend a great deal of my time in clinic, and I don't really have access to a number of lectures. And I'll say as a, you know, a, I think researchers have a little bit more time to avail themselves of lectures across campus. I mean, I'm just struggling to find the parking spot. So <laughs> if I can do it, certainly I'll, I'll be, do, you learn a lot. And so um, you know, I went to a talk in engineering, and then turns out one of the heads of um, industrial engineering and, and patient safety is going to collaborate with us and help us improve our processes and flows. It just <coughs> came out of going to a talk. Yep. Yeah, I'm done. Another, Go ahead. <laughs> another simple, I mean, very, very simple low hanging fruit. Go on PubMed or go into a database and, and see number one, what the person has published. Just like if you're in grad school and you're trying to choose a lab, or a postdoc, you're going to see what has this person done, and where are they in, in the in the author list? Is this a full professor who's first author on the majority of papers? Which I'd be like, whoa, what's you know, why is that the case? Um, or is it somebody who seems like they're sharing credit to to, to get a sense of the structure of their output? Uh, I think is important and and easy. I have a a friend who's at Emory. And um, he now has this collaboration with the CDC because a woman who was at his church said to him, "Hey, you do stuff with drugs, right?" <laughs> Apparently, they had—I don't—I can't remember what it. Oh, I think it was um, antidepressants in pregnancy or something. They had this huge CDC set, which he now has access to because just someone that he knew. It's a good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If you meet him at church, it's probably going to be okay. Yeah, maybe. So, so any, I'd love, I mean, really love to hear concepts and questions that, that the participants have in that area. So we just talked about that, the experts and faculty. How do we do that? Is the website really cool? Yeah, and the uh, uh, URL is experts.unish.edu. Yeah, so I've used SciVal. That's, it's, it's a very interesting tool. We actually use that as a departmental performance metric. So we're using SciVal to evaluate um, to evaluate um, um, sort of trends in faculty publication and collaboration, sort of inter and in extra departmental collaboration. So it's, it's very interesting data. I think one thing that, that wasn't mentioned up here is that um, one of the things, so you know, one of the things that makes for really cool team science is when people that don't really share a lot of things in common find themselves working together. And um, and so one of the one of the downsides with SciVal is if you're not careful, what you're going to find, you're going to find people exactly like you, right? And so you, you so here's here's all my search terms, and uh, and you go find those people, and that, that those people are just like me. And um, and so I think one thing um, to sort of expand on something that Amy said was I, I think you need to cross train 
very aggressively, and you need to be thinking, um, trying to, to think about what is it the what is the essence of the thing that you're working on? What is the actual essence, right? So the actual essence is not the structure of the plasmid. The, the actual essence is not that. But but looking for analogy in strange places, and and so you have to put yourself in strange places. You have to find yourself in strange, you know, seminars and talking to strange, you know, strange people. I ask every single person I meet what they do. I every no matter who, who I meet, I say, what do you do? And then I and then I have a follow up. Right, so I don't just sort of say, "Oh, that's great." So, but I always have a follow-up question. So, to what is it exactly they do? But um, you know, so like one of our big collaborators, you know, I found him through well through a cold email to the dean of the College of Engineering, and 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 the dean fired back a list of people. I went to this person's website, and there was a confocal microscope image of particles that they were using for making sort of improved dashboards. And that confocal microscope image looked exactly like the way bacteria arrange when they in, sort of are involved in endocarditis. It was the exact same structure, it was, except it was like an industrial plastic they had made. And, I, and I, I emailed that person, I said, you know, we're working on the exact same problem, except it's like not the same problem. <laughs> and But the measurements are the same, that, I mean, everything about it, there's so many similarities. But, you know, and, and you know, another example, the, the rules that have to determine how fast wastewater sediment will sediment in the anaerobic wastewater treatment plant, the rules for that physics are very similar to the rules for the size distribution of, of particles in the asteroid belt, um, for reasons that I, I, I sort of understand. Um, but, but the way that you start drawing those connections, and we have, I, I, I co advise a student who's using data from both of those data sets to sort of to work on a problem. Um, you, you have to look very broadly, and I think you need to spend time listening to people that you don't necessarily think you have anything in common with and say, well, what is it actually that we do have something in common with? And I think that there's people that are so compelling when you listen to how excited they are to talk about their work. That the, that, that the topic is not even the real thing, right? The topic is not necessarily why you want to interact with them. You want to interact with them because they're so passionate about what they do. They're, they're, there's a short list of people in this institution that I constantly circle back with and say, do we have a reason to interact yet? Is there a reason why we can collaborate yet? And we, and we keep saying no, but we keep meeting because we're just waiting because we, we want to have a reason to interact together. And it's really not based on content. It's based on enthusiasm and just sort of looking for what's the denominator that brings it together to work on it. But but I think that SciVal and sort of search engines are one thing, but I think, you know, looking in unexpected places and finding yourself in unexpected conversations is really very valuable. And, and if I could find a reason to work with a cellist, I'd work with a cellist today, right? So, yeah. Yeah, to kind of follow up on that, I'd really be interested in knowing what all of you think would be the characteristics of a really effective, well-functioning team. Not having, you know, all the ologists on the team, but but how do people interact? What are the conditions that make for a really good team? Well, <coughs> you said it earlier. I, I, I'll, well, I'll, well, I'll give you. I'm going to give you one answer as an example from network science, and in terms of when the brain is working efficient, efficiently, and that's when you have the optimal balance of functional specialization and global integration. And this is something that we talk about in our lab a lot. Uh, and that's you know, that's a, a key into proper brain functioning and consciousness. And I think just as a starting point for the discussion and thinking about some underlying principles of having clear functional specialization, expertise, differentiation, but with a, a principle of global integration um, is something that uh, like the brain, which is fitting out cognition and consciousness, I think uh, facilitates uh, a productive team. I didn't understand anything. <laughs> I, no, I, I think that's valid. I was just teaching my daughter about factorialization. You know, so you start with this big number and then you reduce it down to three times three times three times two. I, I think that the big picture is you all want to work together, like John said. You. You know, hopefully you all possess the same enthusiasm for the topic and question, and, but it has to be distilled down into certain parts because everybody comes with their own level of expertise. And hopefully you can coordinate those um, content areas and expertise. I mean, I think primarily coordination, and we don't put a lot of emphasis on it, but that is a, a top uh, topic. You have to be able to not just integrate, but move uh, through these all, all these layers of coordination. And to your point also, communication is really important. And when you were talking about the lectures, the, the other thing is, if, 
if you're seeing somebody from another field give a lecture, and this is what happened to me when working with somebody from philosophy, I was asked to be an outside committee member uh, for this graduate student's project on the philosophy of consciousness. And when I heard him get in his presentation, I was like, wow, you know, I'm getting, the, you know, he's, he's really communicating to me and I'm understanding it. Um, and I, I thought that it was just critical. And, and sure enough, when he got to the lab, he was able to really engage people because they, they could find those common forms of language to express things, as opposed to somebody who might be so technical that you know they're they're within that that boundary, and, and you know it's going to be really difficult to to cross the barriers or get it down to those units that everybody can work with. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there as well. That, that was exactly what I was thinking. Uh, you know, in, in terms of sort of. Uh, it, 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 uh, it can take up quite a bit of time establishing that rapport, especially you know if you're like with just even with statisticians and electrical engineers, and then you bring the, the, the physicians in, in, and you know in the context of it, I, I, I think uh, I wonder with your experience in multidisciplinary teams, you know, do you do you dedicate time to that um, sort, of, sort of learning a language together or developing a common not really, but I, I try to be sensitive to it. You know, if somebody's giving, you know, if somebody, a junior faculty in, in the lab who has a focus of experimental neuroscience is speaking about something, I might stop the group and say, now, do you understand what this concept is or what is this acronym or what Because everybody has their own, you know, vernacular. So I, I don't know if we, I mean, we have sort of rotating expertise in terms of presenting journal clubs, educating each other, and, and trying to, to have a common language. But I don't know if we've ever really stepped stepped back and, and, and done that explicitly. Yeah. We do. We, I mean, I, I think realistically, once you once you really wade out into the world and you're not talking to people that want to, you know, that you have a biology background, you have to spend a lot of time. I mean, my experience is, is is you know once a week or once every two weeks for a year before you know what you're talking about mm -hmm. and it's really it was a year at least with with the mathematicians what really surprised me was that when i got good at talking to the mathematicians i went to talk, talk to the engineers and the mathematicians and the engineers didn't know what they were talking about when they talked to each other i was like well i thought you guys were doing the same thing <laughs> but but they're not right so so i think i think that that common vocabulary it, there are some areas where it's very tricky right where a word will mean something so different right so sensitivity between engineering, mathematics, and medicine is a profoundly different word, right? And and so you say it, you don't even think about it, but everyone's room is going, "What are you talking about?" Right? And so, so I think that the the language is is I, I think the common language, depending on what the what the work is, that can actually require a tremendous amount of time. Um, and so I, I don't think you should. I, I think that it, it sort of depends, right? Because there's sometimes there's some groups you get into and everyone just sort of knows, and there's some groups where people, you know, I don't even think it's just between. So broad, just fun. Yeah. Right, not so right? right? No, no. Biology within engineering or within yeah. right. So I mean, I mean, you can have huge language gaps. Yeah, from the nomenclature that really yeah. impede progress. They definitely do. But I want to I want to add one other thing about what makes a for a good team. So I think so I think robustness is an issue we didn't really talk about. But so there's many forces that are struggling to tear the team apart all the time, right? And it's just like other opportunities, other business. And I think that one of the things that makes I think that that I think is a sign of a healthy team is that one of them when one of the member goes one member goes offline, the other people step up and sort of make it happen, right? And so nobody nobody can just be like, you know, gung ho driving the whole thing twenty four seven for fifty years. I mean nobody can do that, right? Stuff bad stuff happens to everybody, right? Somebody gets sick, something else happens and and so anyone in the team potentially could, you know, not necessarily stumble but but it's, it's suddenly going to not be doing the lifting they were doing before. And I think that a sign that the team is healthy is that uh, the, the team sort of understands that and says, we're going to sort of keep this going, and it's not going to be quite the way it was for a while, but we'll figure it out. And I think that that, that sort of, you know, you know, sort of resistance to being perturbed and sort of rattling apart is, is a sign of a really good team. That's actually, you, you'd hope you never have to see that, but, you, but every team sooner or later will see that, right? Someone will get recruited away, something will happen, and, and can the team sort of hold it together? And I think those are, those are signs that, that you know, that the, that the whole has now sort of gotten bigger than just, you know, individual interests. But it's, um, but they're, you know, I always, I always worry that something will take apart the teams that, that I work on because I really like them, but yeah, but, but things happen, right? So.
I'm curious about whether you each have a primary team and then participate in other teams or whether you're really participating on a bunch of teams and you know whether you have a preference for advice for one versus the other. So I do have a primary team just based upon having a program, um, but um, but I do have other teams, yeah, for sure. That and I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily the leader, but yes. Um, but there's, there's spokes off the primary team, so frankly, I'm not that diversified. <laughs> My guess is that happened after your primary team got established and secure. That's right. And, and, and you and your career also became more secure. Right. I'm still not that secure. I, uh, <laughs> I think you know, and um, I yeah. never. I don't know when I'm going to feel secure, frankly. Um, so, so it sounds like if there's actually a strategy that is important to form to find if you want to do science in this way. That it's helpful to actually find people that you create a very solid team with before you start. Is, is before you start, you know, joining other people's teams or. I, you know. Right, and the team doesn't have to be five or six people. It can be two of you, okay. right? And things grow um, as you get busier and as you establish your foundation. But, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I definitely have kind of my go-to people okay. when I want a quick answer, and then it may go out to the rest of the group okay. at a later date. Yeah. I think it, it, yeah, I just have to look at my calendar. Like, where do I devote my time? Right. So, like, we have we have we have group meetings, you know, which are multidisciplinary. You know, every Thursday we have group meeting. And that's that's a dedicated time. So it's definitely sort of the core group as well. And then I work out of the project, so it's not like you know everything that leaves the lab is part of this thing. Or that's actually far from the truth. But the things that I love, the things I read about at night, that's you know those that's part of the, that's the team. Right? Okay. So. Thanks. You know, I wanted to say something about communicating. And, um, and I also think it's about speaking different language, and it's also important to be okay with not knowing what someone's saying and saying, I really don't know, or I just mean, I'm, I'm not a physician, I'm not, I wasn't, like I said, a clinician, but I was meeting with two physicians, and they were talking about, like, measuring contracture, and like, and they were, and I said, you mean you're going to take the elbow, and you're going to pull it, and you're going to, and, and very simple, I'm not embarrassed to talk like that, that really helps me understand, and I think it, so, I think when you feel like you should know and you don't want to speak up is where you're going to get into trouble on your team. And to be sensitive about when you see somebody not looking lost, I think you stop to check. I think the example you give a sensitivity is excellent, by the way. And, and it's really, yeah. you know, the, the extent to which there are technical meanings to terms that also have you know, common language or, you know, uh, a, a different meaning in other disciplines, that, that can be. I mean, I, 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 it's, it's, um, it's hard for me not to drop into jargon yeah, sometimes oh, because easy, it's yeah. what I'm comfortable with, right. you know. But then the jargon may have, you know, and, and uh, but in any case, I, 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 don't, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, being sensitive to the sensitivity. So, oh, go ahead, yes. Um, I've been to a couple of team science meetings at Northwestern, um, and um, there, so there are a number of researchers who study some teams more effectively, and uh, it's very interesting, I thought I'd share just a little bit with you, particularly about jargon. And um, some people believe that it's the leader who sets the tone where questioning what, what I don't, you know, I don't understand that team, could you please explain it? And that's, um, asking for clarification sort of lets everybody else uh, uh, feel comfortable with asking the next person you know, what do you mean by that team, that term. Um, and the importance of understanding the jargon is um, what it leads to team effectiveness. Those teams that are the most innovative are those that have a shared level of cognition. If you raise the cognition of the entire team into these different disciplines and their methods, then the team can truly become innovative. And that's what um, you know, some of the team scientists do now. So I just want to get through a couple of other questions here before we wrap, wrap up and uh, let people finish their evaluations and get out of here. I, I believe we originally had it scheduled to 2.30, is that right? Yes. Okay. 
No, I'm good. So one of the questions that was submitted with the app, with the, uh, of the, from the participants was how would you go about approaching a needed collaborator or expert at another institution with whom you, whom you don't have a relationship? And that was maybe comes from the Cybal search or your search from PubMed. Um, anybody have an idea of how they would do that? Well, I've asked people in my field whom I do know if they could make introductions, and they often have. Yeah, actually, when I when I send students or other people in my lab out to meet someone to go find an answer, I, I actually ask to edit the cold email before it goes out. Um, and uh, so I, I love sending cold emails, right? So I think it's a great it's a great <laughs> it's a great skill, right? So if you get someone to respond to a cold email, like, you don't know me, but here's why you need to, right? So. Um, so, but, so, my, so I, I cold email a lot, right? And I just see something that's interesting or so, something I don't understand, I'll just, I'll just send it out. And, uh, and I mean, the cold email is, you know, it's, you know, in the first paragraph, you have to sort of say, you know, one sentence, who you are, why you saw their work, and how much you love it, and, and if they have time to answer a question, right? And then, and then be prepared to go to their office, or, I mean, if it's like someone that's, the question is sort of like someone outside the institution. So, I mean, if, is it that important to say, you know, if I set up a week, you know, where I could come a couple days, spend some time with your grad student learning this, could I visit? You know, could I just come, right? So those sort of things, like if you're prepared to sort of like, you know, travel to go see something, you know, that that's not really necessary all the time, but, but I think that you, um, you always need to sort of be prepared to sort of do all the all the work. And I think the other thing is, um, it's a, especially very early on, um, the question, you know, I need help with this, can you do this, um, is not very effective. But but I think the question, you know, I, I, I really try to understand this better and I would love to know some more about what you know about this. Or if you're looking for like relationships or even more involved, say, you know, you know, I'd love to be involved in what you're doing, you know, what can I do for you? Right, and, and so I think that's always I think that's always a, an early thing is to say not to approach a new collaboration with you know how can you help me but how can I help you and sort of saying you know there's and, and but but the cold email is a skill you have to you have to work on and it doesn't always work but it's a, but once you can do it once you get people to nibble um, it's it's very useful because that's how you get a lot of stuff done that's how you you get new resources is by figuring out how to get people to respond to, to it's also email. thinking very carefully about what your title is the email. Because I've gotten some weird yeah. email questions. Can you help me? And Those are ones I usually don't answer. How persistent yeah. do you think you need to be? I mean, you know, so so a, a, a seasoned or senior investigator, mm -hmm. an old guy like John, <laughs> versus someone who's in early stage may have have to use different tactics, right? Mm -hmm. And, and um, I don't know if anyone out here has some experiences on what was successful or not successful. I'm, I'm like John. I, I like people's work. I email them and I tell them why I think what they're doing is really interesting and I tend to get responses. But you have to, I mean, I think the way you have to view it is you're selling the connection. You have to yeah. prove to them up front immediately why they should care <coughs> about reading your email. And it, it's a sale. It's a sales pitch. So. I think the thing that I often will do is I'll say is there someone that manages your calendar, right? So just get right on into it, right? Say, I want to come meet you. And rather say, you know, is there a time we can meet? Just say, is there someone that manages your calendar I can speak to about maybe setting up a meeting? And then they just download it. Then it's off their desk. They can forward it on, and then it's go, and it's go right? And so um, that's, that's the trick I usually use is, you know, who do I talk to but meet you? Any questions regarding that? Statements? How, how do you handle, I mean, if, if you're not the leader of, of a collaborative team, how do you handle and where is it introduced what the expectations are? Like, so if I, and, and you know, uh, if, if, if uh, um, I mean, from my perspective, uh, if, uh, if uh, I've, I've contacted uh, some, uh, you know, former colleagues or looking at different, uh, employing different analytic methods, and I'm just wondering, like, where is the best way to handle within the team this question of inviting external authors, and uh, you know, like, what what amount of work, you know, within the context of, and I, I realize, you know, it's like, it, it's it's not necessarily an answer, a question that can be answered for all cases. So, I guess that that is sometimes a confusion for me. I, I don't know if I can directly answer your question. I think one thing, sort of, my policy is, which is sort of related to what you're asking is, is that is to me authorship is like the easiest thing in the world, right? If someone so if I meet with someone more than twice and if it's just meeting just to talk about some issue, they're like 
teed up, right? That, that person's probably going on the paper, right? So I think that the days of, you know, well, we're going to put two people on this paper, that's it. And I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand the point of that. I think that the, the value of joint authorship is huge. So there's, in, there's investment, even if it's not small, that's like, that's, you know, that's something that, even though people may not be working for papers and they get paper uh, authorship on a paper, that's a great thing. Usually, almost always, not always, but usually. Um, and the other thing is, is that, you know, once that, once that thing is, you know, on an author list, then that's referenceable in a grant and say, you know, we aren't just like talking about maybe doing something. It's like, we're this already, you know, it's a done deal, we're going, right? And so I think that the, the value of co-authorship um, is is so high that I that I hardly ever ask twice about whether or not someone should or should not go on a paper. It's just like, if, you know, if they know about it and I'm asking them what they think about stuff, and they, and, and they're in, right? Um, and, and they may not ask a lot of them, we may not do it again, but, um, but we did, we did this analysis of, in emergency medicine, there's not a lot of researchers in, in my specialty, and we did this analysis a couple years ago where we actually found every R01 funded investigator in our field in like 2009, and it was 18 in the country, right? There are 18 people that had R01s in my specialty. And, and we emailed them, and every one of them sent me their CV, and we sort of established their their publication pattern in the 10 year run up to their R01. And say, what's it look like when someone's sort of taking off, right? And um, in the, um, you know, the average, so on average, people that were in the decade up to their first R01, and my guess is this is what a lot of people's careers look like, in that run up, um, it was, you know, on average, five new co authors a year, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, um, and so people were, so that, that run up looks very collaborative. It looks like lots of people are involved. And those, some of those people are students, some of them are very senior, but there was this churn of new people and the appearance of new people on their CVs. And, um, <coughs> And, and I think that that, I, and I don't know if that's universal or not, I know that it's, it's what our specialties experience is, but I think that it, it, to me that suggests, to me that seems like a good thing, right, is that there's a lot of people involved. I mean, you, I can, you can imagine that you could be sort of closer to the team that's very tight-knit and everyone's just sort of working together as a group, but, but our experience, you know, in my field at least, is that that's not what people do. People, people are encountering all sorts of collaborators and working with them and, and, and building up those networks. And they're, it, it's, I think the evolution of that network is a very interesting, that's a very interesting sociological thing about how do you, how do you become sort of enmeshed, you know, on the run-up to your sort of independence. It's an interesting problem. Everyone's looking at me, so I think it's time to wrap up. <laughs> so um, I think we will wrap up because we want to end this before it gets too long and let you get out of here and take some food on your way out. Um, please thank, I want to thank the panelists. Very fun. Thank the participants and thank the organizers from Mishar and the co-sponsorship from Office of Research and Development, uh, Office of Development and Faculty Affairs. Um, uh, going forward, um, really would appreciate your comments. I know that the, the team would really uh, like to see what you have to say because it's going to have impact on where we go forward with the team science uh, format. Um, you know, is this what we do again, or do we do we push it forward and, and try uh, new uh, techniques in delivering what needs to be done in team science? What you need. Um, again, any final words from the panel? Mm. Yep, have fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Very good. Thank you. Do you want to collaborate? <laughs> I think that is the message. <laughs> and um, I believe emails are available from the team, uh, both the panels and the, the Mishar team, if you have any questions, especially if you want to get some more information about what other programs are available through Mishar, our Office of Research and Development. Thank you. That's great. That's very fun.